Hello, my name's Pam Miller. I'm one of the church family at St Mary's Withall. This morning's reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? they ask. What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house, is a prophet without honour. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a rather sad story about rejection and unbelief. And I think there are lessons for us about both in it. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. This was where he learnt his trade from Joseph and he probably attended the same synagogue that's mentioned in the passage. As an adult, and possibly when his brothers and sisters were old enough, or his brothers I suppose, were old enough to take over the carpentry business, he moved to Capernaum. This is a bigger town, maybe it was better for starting his ministry from, perhaps easier for meeting people and travelling out from. So in the passage, Jesus has gone back to Nazareth. It's not his first recorded visit back to there. Luke tells of a previous visit when Jesus taught in the synagogue, but the people turned against him. He told them that God was ready to accept Gentiles if the Jews rejected him. And the people drove him out of town, we're told. So has Jesus come back now to give them a second chance to believe in him? This time he went as a rabbi with a full entourage of disciples. He probably stayed a few days, maybe with his family, because we're told when the Sabbath came, suggesting that he was already there. People must have known of his miracles and his reputation because they were happening around them. So that was maybe why he was asked to preach in the synagogue as a visiting rabbi. We don't know what he said, but we do hear the people's reaction. And it wasn't what we might expect for a returning son, someone with a record of performing miracles. I was rather reminded of the gold pillar boxes that you see in some of the towns and villages. These were painted by local councils to celebrate 2012 Olympic medal winners. A sign of pride. There's somebody in our community who's done something great. Didn't seem to be like that in Nazareth. Why didn't the people listen to Jesus? They advanced several excuses, but underlying them all is unbelief. Firstly, the people say, where did this man get these things from? Perhaps the implication is he hasn't been to rabbi school, so how's he learnt them? Where did his miraculous powers come from? In other words, he didn't have them before, and this rather gives the lie to the tales that he'd performed miracles as a child that you sometimes hear. Maybe the people were hinting that the powers were from the devil, not from God. Or did they think he was a bit uppity, above himself? They acknowledged he had wisdom, but they plainly didn't believe that it came from God. I wonder if we ever dismiss someone's message because we don't think they have the necessary learning. Then there was familiarity. He was the local handyman. The Greek word that we translate as carpenter means someone who works with stone, wood or so on. We'd probably call them a handyman. There's a similar term in that we came across in Kenya, fundi. Somebody who you call on when you need anything doing in your house. So he was good with his hands, but miracles? People plainly couldn't see beyond his humanity. It's a lesson to us, not just to look at the externals of a person. God can use anyone. 
He told Samuel in the Old Testament, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Then there was a degree of contempt. They called Jesus Mary's son. Now it's probable that Joseph was dead. But was this also a suggestion that he was illegitimate? Not to name someone's father was a calculated insult. Who does this man think he is? Look at his background. Incidentally, the two of the brothers named James and Jude later became followers of Jesus and they've both written a letter in the New Testament. So what does this passage have to say to us? I think there are two messages, as I said at the start, about rejection and unbelief. Firstly, Jesus didn't give up on people who rejected him. Rejection is hard. Maybe you've tried to talk to someone about Jesus or you've invited them to church or to Alpha and they've said no. Jesus returned to Nazareth. He loved people too much to give up on them. Is there someone that you or I need to talk to again? Or have you rejected Jesus and done something so bad you think he won't ever want any more to do with you? Jesus loves us too much to ever give up on us and will never ever turn away anyone who comes to him. Sometimes friends or people close to us reject us. Jesus knows all about that, not just because of this incident here, but think of his desertion by the disciples in his time of greatest need before the crucifixion and in his betrayal by Judas Iscariot. In Jesus, we have someone who will never reject us and understands the pain that it causes. Then there's a the matter of unbelief. We read that Jesus was amazed or astounded by the people's lack of faith. After all they had perhaps seen, certainly heard about, they still refused to believe in him. Unbelief can have serious consequences. My husband Steve is a keen walker and map reader and ever since I've known him he's emphasised to me, believe the compass, believe the compass, even if you don't think it can possibly be right, unless you're at one of the poles, then the compass will be true. People have walked off cliffs when they haven't believed their compasses. The Bible is like our compass, we ignore it at our peril. Do we ever read what the Bible tells us about Jesus, but we just can't believe it, so we discard any notion of following him? Because the people of Nazareth didn't believe in Jesus, he could not do any miracles there. It says, apart from a few healings, I think we'd settle even for those, wouldn't we? Sometimes we think, if only that person I'm praying for was healed, they'd believe in Jesus. But miracles rarely lead to faith. Faith leads to miracles. Jesus did miracles in the absence of faith, but not where there was hard and willful unbelief. Jesus never performed miracles for the sake of it, just to show off his power, but to bring the opportunity for faith. Think about some of the people he healed. Some already had strong faith, but for many others it was very shaky. But I can't think of anyone who was healed when they actually actively refused to believe that Jesus could or would heal them. Unbelief is a choice we make. It's a matter of the will. If you're struggling with unbelief, talk to God or to a Christian friend about it or contact the church website. Amanda, our vicar, would love to help you on your journey. What about those of us who are Christians? Do we follow Jesus, but we just can't believe he will do for us what he says he will? We read his promises, for example, never to leave us or forsake us, but we don't really believe it, so we carry on worrying and what ifing. Does our lack of faith hinder miracles happening in our church? I'm always challenged when I hear of people in places like China, where the gospel really is news. They haven't become immune to it. They take the Bible at its face value. They're told in the Bible, if they pray for the sick, they will recover and the dead will be brought back to life. So they do it and it happens. 
Is Jesus amazed at our lack of faith? And I include myself in this. Supposing Jesus came to Hollywood and Withal, what would he find? Would he be amazed and saddened by our unbelief and be unable to do wonderful miracles for us? Or would he find groups of people who love him, trust him and want to be part of his kingdom? Amen.